Hello, I'm Jim Jenkins from Applied Technology Institute. I'm the founder and president of the company. Wanted to introduce you to some video samples from our courses. These video samples are the instructors who actually teach the course, giving you a brief description of what the course is intended to cover, what's unique about the course, and then you actually get to see them present five or six slides as part of the course to get a feel for the level. Hello, my name is Dr. Jerry Lemieux, and I'm here today to teach you a three-day course on unmanned aircraft vehicles, otherwise known as unmanned aircraft systems. So in the course on the first day, we'll talk about the basics, the actual components of an unmanned aircraft vehicle, the vehicle itself, the payload, and the communication systems that are used in order to put this system together and make it functional. We're going to discuss in the course both military, civil, and commercial applications. As everyone knows, uh, the military is using unmanned aircraft vehicles, uh, has been using them for quite a while. An emerging application is in the civil and commercial world and uh, this course will help you prepare for what's coming in the future. So the next topic we'll talk about on the first day is uh, the types of UAVs that are out there. There are many various types and the different roles that are being uh, employed in the civil and commercial world. Next we'll talk about the military operations that are currently going on and the different missions that are flown with the unmanned aircraft vehicles. Finally, we'll talk about the different sensors. Obviously, uh, many applications today are, are using uh, unmanned aircraft vehicles for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. And there are specific sensors on the unmanned aircraft vehicles that are uh, the enablers for that. So we're going to talk about the sensors themselves and the characteristics, the technical characteristics of those sensors so that you understand them better. Finally, on the first day, we'll talk about one case study where uh, we're going to talk about alternative propulsion systems. Currently, we have our aircraft flying with uh, jet engines or piston engines for propulsion. And in the future, and there are currently programs under development to use solar power and fuel cells in order to provide energy for propulsion for the unmanned aircraft vehicles. One of the uh, applications is uh, for uh, keeping a, an unmanned aircraft in the air up to five years and using it as a pseudo satellite or communications relay. And then on the second day we'll talk about the actual communications and data links that are necessary in order to move information around between the ground uh, from one point on the ground to another using either UAVs or satellites. Next, we'll talk about how the military designs UAVs to uh, carry weapons and talk about the future unmanned combat aerial vehicles that are going to be employed in future conflicts. Next, we'll talk about how we actually design an unmanned aircraft vehicle, in a new area of study. There are no books on design, so we're going to try to familiarize you with, with how uh, designers are using uh, applications and uh, processes from designing normal aircraft and applying that to the UAV industry. Next we'll talk about fault tolerant control which is basically an understanding that many of the vehicles are, are having problems because we're, we're rushing them into production and we're not giving a lot of thought to, to uh, what happens when something goes wrong, when a system fails on a platform that's flying in the air. So there's ways to design in fault tolerance so that when something does go wrong, the computer can make a decision and enable the aircraft to continue to fly without having a, an incident. Next we'll talk about uh, operations and we'll talk about the military operations, how they're being performed in the United States and in, and in the conflicts. Next day. Finally on the third day of the course, one of the issues uh, that's currently uh, coming up is integrating unmanned aircraft systems in the national airspace. So uh, we have many platforms coming back from the wars, and we also have civil and commercial applications that are emerging. All of these vehicles are going to be flying in the same airspace that the airliners are in, and we have to make sure that we properly integrate those aircraft with existing aircraft so we don't have any incidents. One of the committees I, I, I sit in on is called uh, RTCA, and we're working on sense and avoid systems where we can actually have a sensor on the UAV that will detect a conflict and then program a computer to make a turn to avoid a collision. 
Next we'll talk about the human machine interface, an area that needs a lot of study and research. Uh, as you have probably seen from some of the control stations on the ground for the unmanned systems, they look more like engineering displays versus an actual cockpit. I flew fighters in the Air Force and the, the ground control station for a UAV looks nothing like a fighter cockpit. Autonomous control. Well, we are controlling these by computer programming. We program the route of flight in and then a pilot will monitor the route of flight. But we want to get to a point where we don't need a pilot in the loop. We want, the, we want to be able to fly the uh, manned aircraft using automation and we also want to have uh, the, air, the aircraft think for itself and make decisions. That's called autonomy. Next we're going to talk about alternative navigation. Most of the systems are using GPS for navigation. What happens when the GPS fails? Is there another way for the UAV to navigate? And there are several systems that we're going to talk about in the course for navigation. Next we'll talk about an application uh, that the military is currently uh, investigating and that is flying multiple UAVs in a swarm in order to launch an attack. It's very advantageous and very effective to have many systems flying together to uh, uh, attack a, 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 an adversary. And uh, in that scenario, the, uh, the different systems take on uh, behaviors. They communicate with each other on their own, take on behaviors, and perform the mission on their own without any pilot intervention. That's called swarming. Finally, we're gonna talk about the future. What's coming up, up in space? What, uh, what kind of uh, pseudo-satellites there are out there for keeping uh, unmanned aircraft up for a long period of time, and uh, some of the future designs and roles in the civilian world and the commercial world for unmanned aircraft. In this segment of the course, we'll be talking about uh, different sensors that are carried by unmanned aircraft vehicles, and we're going to discuss some of the technical characteristics behind those sensors so that you can understand uh, better how they function and are employed. So black body radiation, and all matter emits electromagnetic radiation. Thermal radiation is a conversion of body thermal energy into electromagnetic energy. Planck's law relates temperature and wavelength to signal level. So every, every um, type of uh, target that you're surveying on the ground has certain characteristics that can be actually predicted if you know uh, these types of uh, parameters and you can associate them with Planck's law. Next slide. Uh, so this is the atmospheric uh, uh, scale for the infrared band. And so what's shown in this diagram is that uh, the atmosphere absorbs energy. At certain wavelengths, uh, infrared energy will not penetrate the atmosphere. If you look at this chart, you can see there are various bands where infrared uh, is effective and other bands where it's not. So in the, in the near IR band, there are various segments where you want to operate. Obviously where there's a hole, you do not want to operate an infrared sensor because that energy is absorbed by the various hydrogen and carbon and oxygen molecules in the atmosphere. So one of the things that you, you, are, uh, uh, you need to do in order to uh, understand the characteristics of an infrared sensor is uh, be able to calculate uh, the, uh, the uh, transmittance and absorptions, absorptions of a target. And so you can use these different parameters associated with a target in order to re relate those two. This slide talks about thermal imagers, which are one of the sensors that are used on an unmanned aircraft. It's a passive device and it's used in the mid and far infrared bands. And so uh, if it looks at the ground, it's called a thermal imager. If it looks forward, it's called a forward-looking infrared imager. So in this example, there's two different um, diagrams shown for what the, what the uh, picture looks like from an infrared thermal sensor and so you can see different fields of view, a narrow field of view and a wide field of view, what the perspectives are on the target that's uh, circled in green. Next one. In this example uh, we're t we talk about shortwave infrared or uh, otherwise known as near, near infrared and show some of the pictures 
of an uh, optical sensor versus an infrared sensor. What are the benefits of using an infrared sensor over an optical sensor? In the diagram on the right, uh, you can see an optical sensor looking at a, a road in a mountainous background. With an infrared sensor, you can see there are much, there are much greater detail in the background. You can expose the, the characteristics of the mountains in the background by using an infrared sensor that's operating in the near IR band. Same thing down here, we have a fire going on, and that is an application for civil use of uh, unmanned aircraft to uh, NASA uses uh, one of the uh, predator, modified predator aircraft with uh, infrared sensors in order to help fire fi enable firefighters to do their job better. One of the things you can do with these near wave infrared sensors is you can see it with an optical sensor, you can only see the smoke and the trees, but with an infrared sensor, you can actually pinpoint the hot spots. You can see the fire in the background where, uh, where the most uh, damage is being done and, and concentrate your firefighting efforts in that area. Over here, you can see a difference between a longer wave infrared sensor and a short wave infrared sensor. There's a little bit more cloudiness in the long wave infrared and a lot more detail in the short wave infrared. That, the reason for that is the wave, as the wavelength gets smaller, you're going to be able to expose more detail in the image.